If you are a Muslim, Christian, or other theist looking to bolster the arguments for your faith, there are a ton of erroneous arguments out there that you should avoid. But today we're going to focus on one often used line of theistic reasoning that's particularly egregious. Let's assume for a moment that you're convinced that the universe has a creator. A big bang needs a big banger. Why does that creator have to be an all-powerful god? Here are seven possible alternatives to an all-powerful god that you may never have even thought of. Hi, I'm Thomas Westbrook, a former evangelical Christian missionary kid born again as a bright-eyed curious atheist, and I'm on a journey to explore how the world really works using my trustworthy tools of scientific skepticism and critical thinking. If you're new here, I welcome you to smash that subscribe button and come along for the ride. When arguing for the existence of God, we've all seen pastors, apologists, imams, or theologians start by arguing for a first cause that created the universe before leaping to the assumption that that cause must be God, specifically their God. The most notable example of this is William Lane Craig with his Kalam cosmological argument. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist Therefore, the universe has a cause. Don't worry, this video isn't about the Kalam and its many problems. Plenty of other channels have already done that, and even the physicists who Craig misquotes have called him out and done a rebuttal. I'll pop a playlist with some of those responses below, but what I want to focus on is what comes next. We'll ignore for the moment the fact that most cosmologists don't actually claim that the universe had a beginning. The expanding era of inflation that we're part of must have a past boundary someplace. That does not necessarily mean the universe had a beginning. That something came from nothing. The Big Bang was not the beginning. There was an eon prior to us, one before that, one before that, etc. Or that the Big Bang was the beginning of everything. The Big Bang theory has absolutely nothing to say about the question of how the universe started. What it does describe is what the universe looked like when it was very much younger. We'll ignore the multiple cyclical universe models, we'll forget about multiverse theory, and of course don't worry about the fact that when you extrapolate the universe's expansion backwards in time, time itself kind of breaks down as space-time becomes infinitely dense, making the word beginning kind of meaningless. Ignore all of that, and let's assume for a moment that apologists know more about cosmology than actual cosmologists. You know. I'm something of a scientist myself. That our universe did indeed have a beginning for sure, and that it did have a cause. The theist still has to get from first cause, which could be two brains colliding together, or a new universe springing into existence as the result of a black hole, or any number of other possibilities. They have to get from there to a conscious first cause, a creator. And then from that to an all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent conscious first cause, to their specific omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent conscious first cause, who made all of this with us in mind. But why assume that the Big Bang had to have been triggered by an equally big god? After all, you don't need to be the size of a nuclear blast or have the strength of Godzilla to create or detonate a nuclear bomb. Similarly, why couldn't the creator of our universe be just as mortal and weak as you or I? After all, a stage 4 bone cancer patient in a wheelchair could push a button and level a city. What if our Big Bang was actually triggered by some kind of doomsday device, and our creator in some previous universe was actually a psychotic terrorist who died by triggering the device? But I can already hear some of you revolting in the comments. Stupid atheist! The fundamental constants of the universe are so finely tuned for life that it had to have been the product of design, not some destructive force of terrorism. And I hear you. In fact, I already made an entire video responding to the fine-tuning argument, so I'm not going to get into that here. Instead, let's run with your criticism. Assuming that it is fine-tuned, why can't it be both fine-tuned and destructive? Like an eco-terrorist wiping out a civilization so that nature can re-emerge unhindered. Our new universe could have been masterfully designed, with all of its parameters tweaked such that the new universe would allow for life, but its birth could have wiped out everything in the old universe that got in its way. The main point here is that universe-creating technology doesn't necessarily need to be supernatural. In the book Profiles of the Future, An Inquiry into the Limits of the Possible, Arthur C. Clarke formulated three laws about science and technology, the third of which states that any sufficiently advanced technology would be indistinguishable from magic. Shermer's Law takes it a step further. Any sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial intelligence would be indistinguishable from God. Or here's another scenario. What if the creator of our universe actually was a big, powerful genius, bigger than our entire universe? That alone still wouldn't make 
it supernatural, omnipotent, or all-knowing. They're just relatively larger. They could still have triggered our Big Bang using advanced technology, creating universes in the same way that ecologists plant trees. Ours would be just one among a countless multitude of others. For all we know, our creator died billions of years ago, and her descendants could have long since forgotten about our world. Oh, and aside from religious indoctrination, why assume that there's just one creator, and not an entire lab, company, or civilization of creators that works together on universe design, possibly as a fuel source? But let's adapt this scenario and take these colossal creators and grant them another divine attribute for a moment. Eternal existence. Basically, they're immortal and invincible. We can even make them all powerful too if you'd like. Regardless of how long they've existed or how powerful they are, if they're that gargantuan, how would they even know that we exist? Our entire solar system would be orders of magnitude smaller to them than electrons are to us. We could be like microscopic bacteria growing on a forgotten science experiment, an unintentional byproduct too abysmally tiny for them to even detect. Our universes could be the tiny fundamental building blocks of their universe. And even if they did specifically create our universe and they could detect us, they would have no reason to care about us specifically and absolutely no way of interacting with us because they would exist and operate in a world of the very large. Or what if our creators were separated from us by time dilation? Depending on how the laws of physics play out in their wider universe, what if our universe's creators are affected by relativity and because they're so massive, time moves slower for them? So in the breath of time that it takes to wipe the sweat from their safety glasses, all of human history would race past them, vanishing into extinction before they could even figure out how to tell us not to touch our wieners. To some, the lack of divine guidance and supervision is unthinkably terrifying, and I get it. Independence is a terrifying prospect, but part of growing up is discovering the double-edged beauty of autonomy and self-determination. Now, there's no reason to think that a creator has to be all-knowing or omnipresent, or that it has to exist at the scale of our tiny world, or care at all about our existence. But there is a scenario where that might be possible. Simulation theory. Whether you've watched The Matrix or seen your fair share of sci-fi, you're probably somewhat familiar with the simulation theory, which posits that the world around us isn't real, but it feels real to our brains, which are hooked up to a simulation. Or we don't have brains and bodies at all, and are entirely computer-generated parts of the program. The creators of our simulated universe who are running the program still probably wouldn't be omniscient, and would lack awareness of all of the variables, all our thoughts, experiences, and the various events occurring inside the simulation. They would likely just focus on the most important events, the big picture. But the computer would be. Our universe's creators would lack all attributes that we ascribe to the divine, like omniscience, omnipresence, omnibenevolence, etc. But it's the machine running the simulation, which is all-knowing, aware of the status of every single variable. It knows all, sees all, is everywhere at once, even part of the very air that we breathe. But could we really call the computer God? Well, it depends. Is it self-aware? Just because it's simulating a scenario doesn't mean it's freely interacting with it. It's likely just following purely deterministic code. Even if aspects of the world are randomly or pseudo-randomly generated, that doesn't mean that the computer has any say over it whatsoever. And even if it could, can you really call the computer a god if it itself was created? In this scenario, you have a distribution of godlike abilities. It's the computer that's omniscient and omnipresent, but it likely lacks consciousness and the ability to choose. But the programmers who exist outside of our universe's relative time are the ones who are all powerful, who can create new universes, modify the one we live in, or pull the plug altogether at any time. But they're only powerful relative to us. They're relatively divine. Their species still had to evolve naturally, and even if they created us, if they themselves are not the first cause, can we really call them gods? Or are they instead just highly technologically advanced beings indistinguishable to us from gods? While I don't personally think that we're in a simulation, this particular variation of the theory is a better explanation for the problems of evil and suffering than those put forth by religions positing an all-loving god. The god that you serve is too wise to make a mistake, and too loving to be unkind. <laughs> Our source of light gives us cancer, dude. Our simulation's operators could have just gone AFK during the Holocaust, which really begs the question, 
does God poop? Or he could have us on a thousand X speed just to see how the simulation pans out because he's late for dinner and his wife cooked pot roast. We think we're special, but we could be one of countless other universes. What if our simulations programmers live in an eternal universe with different laws of physics where their universe is more static than ours and entropy always stays balanced? The entire point of creating our simulation was to make a universe with different laws of physics where pockets of energy could coalesce and life could evolve, but entropy on the whole would always increase resulting in the eventual heat death of the universe. And elsewhere in their lab, they're simulating a different universe where entropy starts extremely high and always decreases over time, resulting in a great cataclysmic burning. Perhaps life in that universe never has a chance to evolve, in which case we would not expect to find ourselves in that universe, but we would only expect to exist in the universe that allows us to exist. Or what if we ourselves created our universe. Running with the simulation hypothesis, what if the creators of this simulation are currently orbiting around one of the last remaining dying stars in their universe? Unable to stop this process? They could only hope to buy time. So they wiped their memories of their existential terror and entered into a simulation of their own creation where they could live out a million lifetimes in a fraction of a second, experiencing immortality in a slowed down alternate reality. Every time they die, they'd be reincarnated as a different person in the simulation. In essence, we created this simulation ourselves and entered into it, wiping our memories upon entry. And every time we pray to our universe's creator, we're unknowingly whispering words to ourselves. But why would we create a world where we would suffer so much? Perhaps as incentive, because suffering breeds innovation. It breeds creativity. Maybe we're meant to find a solution. Which leads to scenario seven. What if we are R&D, research and development? What if our existence is part of a last ditch effort to reverse entropy? Our universe was created or simulated by a desperate civilization to see if any of the life forms on these many billions of planets could develop a solution to the heat death of their universe. What if we are their hope of reversing entropy. In a way, each of us would be an intelligent node on a gigantic deep learning algorithm with one goal. But right now, we're failing. We're still insufficiently evolved and intellectually infantile, too busy fighting wars and chasing gods of our own making. Now, I do think that some of the biggest problems in our universe and on our planet are worth solving and we shouldn't get distracted from them. But I don't personally think that any of these scenarios for our creation are necessarily true. But the point is that whenever you have to appeal to the existence of a creator to explain how our universe got here, you haven't really answered the question of where everything came from. Instead, you now have two things to explain, how our universe was created and where our creator came from. This isn't a problem for creationists who claim that God is eternal. However, they laugh at the notion that the cosmos could be eternal or could come from nothing, but simultaneously posit an infinitely more complex God that has to be either eternal or to have come from nothing. They cherry pick science when it suits them, claiming that an infinite universe violates the second law of thermodynamics. But you've got to have creation. That's the point. You've got to have creation. The second law of thermodynamics insists on it. But then embrace a God that would also violate the second law law of thermodynamics. On faith, they claim that the laws of physics don't apply to God because he exists outside of our universe. God is eternal. He is outside of the realm of time. But then reject the possibility of any kind of multiverse existing outside of our universe, which naturally follows from string theory, even if it's currently outside of our technological capabilities to measure. Basically, the double standards are endless. Now, these are just a handful among a plethora of possible creator creation scenarios, some more plausible than others. And I'm not saying that you should believe any of them. Just know that it's a lot harder to get from the existence of a creator to the existence of a god than most people realize. And even if you could get all the way there, you now have the tremendously arduous burden of proving that that God is the same God that you believe in. But it's these types of experiments and questions that are worth exploring. They're challenging, they're existential, and they're fun. We should never shy away from scrutinizing an idea simply because we're afraid of the answers that we might find. If it's true, it'll withstand scrutiny. And if it's not, well, then it's not really worth believing in. I'm all for religious freedom, but getting people to ask hard questions, calling out dogma, and pushing back against fundamentalism is what I do full time with this channel. So if you appreciate that, you enjoyed this video, and you want to help 
help me to promote critical thinking and free thought, you can support me and the Holy Kool-Aid team with a donation via any of your favorite payment platforms. Every little bit helps a lot. Or you can make an ongoing per video pledge on Patreon or a monthly pledge on Subscribestar. Things have been pretty tight ever since the Faithless Forum conference, ever since the accident that I got in, and also just with seeing a really big dip in um, AdSense and views, the YouTube algorithm is always changing. So if you are able to make a pledge or donation, it would be huge and mean the world to me and my team. In return, as a thank you, there's a bunch of perks on Patreon too. So I'll, I'll put a link to that below. But that said, it's purely optional and my videos will always be free because I want you guys to be able to watch them and enjoy them. If you already support my work, thank you so much. And as always, dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid.